So before we dive in today's message, I wanted to share a video clip with you guys. It's uh, kind of highlighting the topic that we're dealing with today. Now, I'll give you a heads up. The skit that this comes from, I don't endorse, totally endorse the show, but it is, it really hits the nail on the head today. So I was going to have you guys see this, and uh, it's a funny moment between two co-workers that have some surprisingly good advice. And to be honest with you, the wisdom is simple, but I'm sure this is something we all can relate to. So at this time, if Daniel, go ahead and play that, appreciate it. For those of you that are watching online and you couldn't see the clip because of copyright issues, the reason why some of us are stunned and some of us are laughing is because we just showed a clip where the character said, whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. Seems simple enough, right? If we made every decision in life based upon stopping and thinking about, if I make this decision and an idiot would do it, I shouldn't do that very thing. Seems simple. None of us would ever make a mistake, though, right? Yeah, that's where we're like, wait a minute. We've all been guilty of, at times, being an idiot. We've made decisions that were foolish. Maybe sharing this video this morning, you thought that was a foolish mistake. Well, exhibit A, I told you we all make mistakes. There you go. But as you see in Scripture, Jesus also has a sense of humor. But like I said, imagine if it was just as simple as that. I was reading through the comments on the video, and it said that he literally summed up the entire book of Proverbs. It's true. If you study the book of Proverbs, you'll see that it challenges you to choose wisdom over foolishness. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at what it biblically means to be a fool. What is foolishness? And you'll find that all of us at times have fallen under one of these categories of what it means to be a fool. My goal is for us to obviously not live like fools. We, we, need to, we need to not die a fool. And as I told you, we're going to be going back in the Old Testament, and one of the men that, I don't know how to describe it, he just, if, if there is a guy, if you look up the definition of foolishness in the Bible, or a fool, if we had a picture of King Saul, Israel's first king, he would be there. Every decision he made after his first victory, was just one foolish decision after another. I mean, his life is just a snowball of tragedy of foolish decisions. And that's what we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're going to look at that and read a few verses. Probably should have read it before we showed the video, but that's fine. First Samuel chapter 13, we look at verses 8 to 14. We'll keep it keep short. Here's some pages turning. I warned you guys during announcements to look for First Samuel. Sometimes it's difficult to find, but Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, skip ahead a little bit, First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 13. Let's look at verse 8 down to verse 14. Verse 8 said this, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring me a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. Foolish decision. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, you see what he's doing here? One excuse after another after another. He said, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I, will, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering in our key text. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have done foolishly have done foolishly. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, I pray that you help us as we study your word and cover the topic of what it means to be a fool, that you help us to change our ways. Help us to take your word, apply it to our lives, so that we can live wise lives serving you. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. <clears throat> 
as I said, man, if it was just that simple, if we could just stop and evaluate every decision in life, but we know at times it's, it's not that simple. Sometimes it's pretty complicated. Let me find my place here. 1 Samuel 13. See, I warned you guys in the announcements, and now I've switched back to the King James. Here we go. First thing I want to look at, there's three things specifically I want to look at today. First, I want to look at Saul's beginning. I want to talk about a guy who just had everything. We're going to look at that. Saul literally had it all. And we're going to look at that. And then secondly, we're going to look at Samuel's evaluation. It is, it's a pretty strong statement for him to walk up to Saul and say, you fool. You have acted foolishly. So we're going to evaluate what Samuel actually meant when he said that. And then lastly, we're going to look at the decisions that Saul made that Whenever Samuel stepped on the scene, he said, look, these are decisions that you've made, you're a fool, and we're going to look at how he got there, because usually there's some reasoning behind it. But first, I want to talk about Saul's promising start. If you're a student of the Word, or if you've been in Sunday school class, I think, uh, Mr. Minton, you, were, you covered 1 Samuel for a while, didn't you? Yeah, and this is one of my favorite books. I love this book. If you don't know the theme of Samuel and Kings, it's all about leadership and things you can learn from leaders in that book. But... Um, anyways, if you're a student of the Word, you'll find that Saul's story starts in chapter 9. Saul's one of these guys, he was born into royalty, had a silver spoon per se. He comes from a wealthy family. His dad was a mighty man of valor, which means he had all kinds of money. As a matter of fact, for anyone in those days to have donkeys, it meant that you were almost royalty. He came from a family, had all kinds of money. And on top of that, the Bible says that he was good looking. Now, why they complimented on that, I don't know. But the Bible literally says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, that he was taller and more handsome than anyone else in Israel. It's safe to say that if he was good looking, that his parents had to be good looking, right? Good genetics. Pretty common sense there. This isn't just some contest that he won at a county fair for the cutest baby or homecoming queen at a local county. No, this guy was the most handsome in all of Israel. During that time, scholars estimate there are over 600,000 Israelites during this time. And of all 600,000, Saul was the tallest, the most handsome, came from a wealthy family. He had it all. And on top of that, he was considerate to people. You know, typically people like that to be kind of snooty, they have everything. They treat other people as their dirt and beneath them. I grew up in West Virginia. I grew up in the dirt. So I totally understand that, what it's like for people to constantly look down on you because you don't have money or English is your third language. Amen, right? Some of you are confused. You'll get that later. English is my third language. Hillbilly is probably one, two. I don't know what to call it. But here's a man. Story starts out that his father had lost, I think it was three donkeys, and he goes out searching for him with one of his servants. Three days they're out there, and he says, look, he tells his servant, he's like, maybe we should just go home. I don't want my dad to be constantly worrying about me. And the servant suggests, he goes, why don't we go talk to the seer? Now, if you're a man who's full of pride, you're not willing to take advice, you say, you know, I will tell you what to do. You're the servant. I am the father's son. I am going to lead this pack. But instead, he said, you know what? That's a good idea. He's considerate. He's kind to people. He's concerned about his parents. He's like, look, I don't want my dad to worry about me. Here is Saul's character. This is what his start was. He's humble. When he finally gets to Samuel, Samuel says, you're going to be the king. And he said, me? Me? He said, I, I, I am the least of everyone. He said, I, I'm the tribe of Benjamin. We're the smallest tribe of Israel. How am I of any importance? See the humility there? He's a humble guy. He had it all, the looks, the money, everything. And then on top of that, after he is told he's going to be king, he literally gets God's favor. The Bible says that God gave him a new heart, the ability to serve in the role that God had called him to. And Saul had it all. As a matter of fact, he demonstrated it in his first victory. 1 Samuel chapter 11, I love the story. Uh, you can turn over there if you want to. But Nahash is a bad dude. This ain't corn pop. This is a real bad dude named Nahash. He's an Ammonite. And what he is doing is he is literally going in a group, everybody on the side of the Jordan River. He is going and he is plucking out their eyeballs. Why is he doing that? Because if you only have one eye, it's hard to shoot. 
You can't fight in war with one eye. You, you, can't, you can't be real good with a sword or shooting a bow. So he's doing that so the people aren't able to fight up and rebel against him. And I love the story. They come to a group named, uh, what is it, Jabesh Gilead. And they said, hey, make a covenant with us. Jabesh does, because Nahash is saying, look, we're going to pluck your eyeball out. And this is what they said. They said, make a covenant with us that will serve you. And Nahash, these are the bad guys, they said, on this condition, I'll make it a covenant with you. If I can thrust out all your right eyes, and then it'll be a reproach upon Israel. What he's basically saying is, if we make it a covenant with you, we'll submit to surrender to you, and you pluck out all of our eyes, and we will serve you. (laughs) This is what they say. They're like, okay, we agree to that. And they said, just give us seven days to think about it. Seven days, we're going to see if anybody is willing to defend us. And if we can't find anybody after seven days, then we'll come to you and you can pluck out our eyeballs. It's in the story. It's in the Bible, people. Go check it out. It's a real thing. So what happens is Saul hears about this commotion going on. The Spirit of God fills him, and and Saul goes and he delivers those in Jabesh Gilead. There's a victory there. Saul, who had it all, looks, money, prestige, Everything you could think of. When you looked at Saul, you thought, man, I want to be like him when I grow up. And here he is now serving God as the king. He gets anointed king after that, and he just defeated an army. This dude is on the up and up. He is going strong. But you read his story, and you'll find that it's just a snowball effect after this first victory of one downfall, foolish mistake, one right after another. And you read a summarization of his life in First Chronicles chapter 10, 13, and 14. This is the verses I came across when I was doing my devotion. And this is what it says. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. Wasn't planning on saying this, but I'll go ahead and say it. You study out Saul's name, and you'll find that the root of his name, that Hebrew word, literally means to inquire, to pray. Saul's name, literally, every time it is mentioned, every time he thinks of his own name, because he's a prideful guy, should have reminded him to stop and pray and ask God for help. But his entire life, after his first victory, was completely opposite of his name. He didn't live up to his name, up to his reputation. He didn't pray. And what ultimately cost him his life is whenever he went to the witch of Endor and completely violated God's word, and this was the final straw, the straw that broke the camel's back that cost him his life. What is the story about, man? He started out well, but he died like a fool. Or in the words of Dwight, he was an idiot. He died like an idiot. You're here this morning, you may have started well, you may have stumbled at times, you're not, obviously you're not going to be perfect, but every one of our goals should be to finish well. To finish well. And if we don't, the Bible says that we will have died like a fool. I want to finish well. I remember a story back in high school. There's this guy, he's one of those guys, he's kind of like the guy who just gives it his all. All the time, 100% effort. Anybody know anybody like that? There's just people that just, no matter what they're doing, it's 100% effort all the time. They can be slightly annoying. Why are they annoying? Because they're challenging you because we're being lazy. Man, I need to strive and work as hard as this guy. Well, there was this day, this guy's probably 6'3", 230 pounds, and for a 10th grader in high school, that's, that's pretty big. And he's pretty muscular. So the goal that day was we're going to run a couple miles off campus and then run back to the high school. Well, we're all standing there, and as soon as everybody says go, this kid just takes off sprinting. Remind you, 6'3", 230 pounds, he's a lineman. And the rest of us guys, when I was skinny about 100 pounds ago, we looked at each other and we kind of giggled because we knew what was going to happen. He ain't going to make it. About a quarter mile down the road, we we lose sight of him because he's going around turns and stuff, and I mean, he's just a gettinger, going. But after about a quarter mile, we catch up to him and pass him. What's he doing? He is huffing and puffing. And for the last mile and a half, he's walking and he comes in dead last. What happened? Well, he started well. Man, he didn't finish well. At least he finished the race, but man, he did not finish well. 
And maybe you're here this morning and you think, this, this is my victory. I've had a rough week. I've battled the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm dealing with all these situations in my, in my life. You don't even understand. And for me to be here Sunday morning, this, this is a victory in my life. This means so much to me. You know, I'm glad you're here, and I'm thankful you're here. And if this is a victory for you this morning, and you put all the circumstances aside to come here and worship God and learn from His Word, that, that's a great thing. But if you don't take what is said here this morning, and apply it to your life throughout the week, you're not going to finish well. You're not going to finish well. At the end of the day, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. Saul, I'm telling you, had a promising start. There is no debating it. This guy had everything. But just two chapters later, he started the effect that just constantly downhill. As a matter of fact, it gets to the point where Saul himself, this is many chapters later, and we'll get there eventually, where he looks at David and he said, I have played the fool. He admits it. He himself, he's like, man, I have messed up. Well, let's look at Samuel's evaluation. We've looked at Saul's good start. Now I want to look at Samuel's evaluation. What, what does it mean to be a fool? I want to give you guys a story first. You guys remember back in 2002, probably one of the most famous speeches to ever exist. It's a real short one. But George Bush, in front of a crowd, said this in September of 17, 2002. He said, there's an old saying in Tennessee. I, I can't do the George Bush voice. Sorry, I'll try it for you. He said, I, there's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. Fool me. Well, you can't get fooled again. You guys remember that speech? He totally messed it up. Completely messed it up. It was a, it was a foolish mistake. Apparently, he didn't read the teleprompter very well. But if you guys haven't heard that speech or seen it, go check it out. It's one of the best that a president has given in a while. The truth is, we all try our best to avoid foolish mistakes. And let's be honest. We've probably looked at somebody in their situation, the mistakes that they've made, and they say, you fool. My wife will jokingly say that from time to time. And I'm like, you, you need to calm down with that word. I'm telling you. But we, we say that at times. But what does it really mean to be a fool? I did some research and I found that they're actually... Four Hebrew words that describe what a fool is. And there are also four Greek words that describe what a fool is. So you have four Hebrew words, four Greek words, and one English word, fool. And I studied it out and I found that these four Hebrew words and these four Greek words, they overlap perfectly. So instead of spending time studying eight words, we're going to look at four because they overlap almost identically. And one of the first words that the Bible uses for fool is the word petty, I thought that was kind of ironic, and anahoitos, not real good at pronouncing that. But what do these words mean? It's translated as full. This word describes someone who is naive, inexperienced, someone who lacks maturity in their thinking or decision making. Kind of sounds like uh, all of us teenagers at one point, or others of well who haven't grown up yet. Amen? Still no amen on that. Whew, okay. But this particular fool, the way the Bible describes it, it's not somebody who's malicious. They're, they're not going out of their way to necessarily be wicked. It's just they don't have the experience to understand and have the discernment to, re to make the right decision. You ever been there? You've been in a tough situation? I mean, I don't know which direction to take. God, I need your help. I need the discernment. This is what the Bible's talking about. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 said, How long will you simple ones, petty, will you love simplicity? In the New Testament, Paul uses this word when he says, O foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? This is a kind of fool who, like someone who keeps, keeps making the same mistakes simply because they don't know any better. But there's a potential for growth if they're willing to study it out and learn from their mistakes. So not that bad. But then the next way the Bible describes a fool is someone who acts impulsively, emotionally, recklessly, without considering the consequences of their actions. The word is evil and Afron. Not Ephron for Zachaphron, but Afron. This is what it describes. Someone who is impulsive. The Bible teaches that this fool operates in pride. They're convinced that their way is right, even when evidence points otherwise, and they refuse advice or correction because they trust 
in their own understanding. What happens? This reckless behavior often leads to disaster. Why? Because they're just unwilling to reason. You try and talk to them. You try to explain, hey, you are heading for destruction. This is not going to end well. If you say this to your wife, you say this to your husband, you know what's going to happen because of it, but yet we say it and we do it anyways. The Bible says this is what it means to be a fool. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And in the New Testament, when Jesus is describing a parable of a rich man who was storing up all his goods, living for materialism, not thinking about eternity, Jesus finished it with this. He said, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. He's not thinking about eternity. The man who does not think about eternity and the, actions of his consequ- or the, the consequences of his actions, you are living like a fool. The next group takes it a step further. This is words that describe a fool who goes beyond mere recklessness into open rebellion against God. The Bible calls this fool morally corrupt. They reject God's wisdom, the ways of God. And here's the problem. They know the truth. This is someone who knows what the Word of God teaches, and they say, I don't care. That's good for you, not good for me. And maybe even claims to be Christian, but they say, nah, not going to do it. You are acting like a fool when you neglect what the Word of God says. Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I was watching YouTube the other day, a hobby of mine, and somebody asked ChatGBT, everybody familiar with ChatGBT? Well, if you're not, it's an artificial intelligence, it's AI program, where you can ask it questions, and it'll do research for you and give you the answers. Well, somebody... With that, ask them the question. It says, if you were a human, would you believe that the universe was created or do you think it's coincidence? And ChatGBT said this, if I were a human, I would believe this universe was created. They asked the question and said, can you explain further? ChatGPT says that the, world is ordered, the way the world is ordered suggests intentional design rather than random choice. The existence of moral values, consciousness, and the origins in the universe itself seems to point towards a purposeful creator rather than a mere coincidence. Computer software. Do you know what that says according to Scripture? That all of those that are claiming to be atheists, they they are by definition acting like a fool, but they're not being honest with themselves. Because according to Scripture, everybody knows there is a God. Everybody. You have a conscience that makes up with it. You can look around and see the universe and know there is a God, but yet they are living contrary to it and pretending as if God does not exist. And Paul described it this way in Romans chapter 1. He said, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. God says, okay, if you want to lie to yourself and lie to others, surrender, surrender you over to that. It's a scary thing. And then lastly, the Bible describes two words of another type of fool. And I saved this one for last for one purpose because if you have your Bibles open still to 1 Samuel chapter 13, this is the word that Samuel uses to describe Saul. The word is kessel, or in Greek it's moros. Moros. Sounds familiar. Why? Because we get the English word moron from it. When Samuel stepped on the scene, he looked around and he looked at what Saul had done. He looked at him and he said, you moron, what have you done? These are pretty emphatic words here. He didn't just say this loosely. He said, you have just acted like a moron. That's pretty harsh. Matter of fact, when Jesus in the New Testament, he said this, using this exact same word, he said, I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, you moron, shall be in danger of hell fire. Tell you what, if you use that word, don't use it loosely. That's why I'm trying to keep it within the context of Scripture. But the way Samuel describes Saul is, he said, man, you have acted like a moron. This is like 
driving down the road and seeing a sign that says the bridge is out ahead. And a wise person would stop and think, would an idiot keep driving and ignore the sign? Yes, he would. So I would not do that. But imagine a driver, he's so convinced the road is better, he he knows the road better than everybody else, he ignores the signs, he laughs at everybody else turning around, and he keeps on going, and he doesn't even care that the road is out. He knows it's out, but yet he's still convinced in his mind that he is going to make and bridge the gap. What happens? The moros, the kessel, the fool, keeps driving and drives right into a pit along with everybody else in the car. You can choose your actions, but you can't choose your consequences. And if you are living a foolish life, it is only a matter of time before those consequences catch up to you. You know, there are several different words that describe what foolishness is. It's not just about making a mistake or lacking knowledge or foolishness in a biblical sense. It's rejecting wisdom, living recklessly, and being spiritually blind. And I'll be honest with you, there are times in my life, and there's going to be times in the future, I'm sure, where all of us at times act foolishly. We've been there. Every one of us, if we took the time, I could ask everybody to come up here on stage and share it. We'll record it, put it on YouTube. That way, if you want to go back and listen to it again. But we could share times in our lives, maybe even times right now that we are living foolishly. And we're thinking it's not going to cost us, it's not going to catch up to us, and that's exactly the way that Saul was thinking in this very moment. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even considering what could happen, getting ahead of myself a little bit, he just didn't care. He just flat out didn't care. So we've looked at his beginning, we've looked at Samuel's evaluation, and lastly I want to look at uh, Saul's foolish decision. Let's give you the story as quick as I can, but... In chapter 13, scholars argue about this, but they come to the conclusion that Saul is around 30 years old at this time. He is leading an entire nation at 30 years old, and the only two people that he can trust are himself and his son Jonathan to lead the military. His son Jonathan at the time is around 15 years old. You have a 15-year-old and a 30-year-old leading an entire nation. It's a scary situation. But you'll read through Kings and Chronicles and see there were a lot younger kings at that time. But what made them and determined whether they were going to be successful or not is how well they took counsel from other people around them. Were they willing to listen? Were they willing to heed advice from God's Word? And you'll see throughout the Old Testament, you'll read that some kings did and some kings didn't. Some kings started out well, some kings failed. Some kings finished strong. They all had mistakes. We've all been there. So here's Saul. He's 30 years old. He's got 2,000 men with him. He's got his son Jonathan with 1,000 other men. We're back in chapter 11, they had 330,000 men. So you go from 330,000 people down to 2, and 1 is 3,000. Math right there. Pretty scary situation. Who are they up against? They're up against almost 20, or 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. Now, why in the world are these soldiers so terrified? Well, you do some research and you'll find out that the only two people in the entire group that had a sword, Saul and Jonathan. The rest of them had rocks. It's hard to tell what else. Maybe they got a frying pan from their wife. I don't know. They show up to the day and they're fighting and that's all they have is a rock, a frying pan. Jonathan and Saul, they have a sword. It's pretty scary. Here they are in Gilgal. They're looking around and it's a couple miles away, but use your sanctified imagination. And this is what happens. Those people that were with him, 3,000 people, they begin to get terrified and begin to leave. The Bible says that some of them jumped into caves. Others squeezed into thickets. Others jumped into cisterns like frogs hiding in the water supply. Then there's others that looked around and said, nope, dove into the Jordan River and began to swim and went completely away. They said, I ain't staying here for this. You guys are crazy. So you go from 330,000 to 3,000 to 600 men. And Saul, he's standing there, he's looking around, and he checks his sundial watch, and he said, hey, you you guys heard that Samuel's supposed to be here in seven days, right? Maybe this thing needs new batteries. I don't know what's going on here. But in, in his own mind, he knows Samuel did say seven days. Samuel is supposed to be here. He's not here. I can hear the crowd way, ways away. They're going to come here and kill us. What am I going to do? And the Bible says he doesn't inquire of the Lord. He takes the sacrifice, the most sacred sacrifice, if you study out Scripture, And he offers it, and as soon as he's done, Samuel shows up. 
And what's he do? He starts giving excuses. One after another. What did he really do? Look at verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. Or verse 8, I should say. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel appointed, but Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered. And Saul said, bring hither the burnt offering. What, what is Saul doing? When he says, go ahead and bring the offering, he's doubting God's word. If you pay attention closely, you'll see that after Samuel rejects him, he said, God commanded you to do this. Do you realize what, what's going on here? Saul wasn't just told by Samuel. This came from God himself that what God told him to do is you are to wait seven days. So Saul, he doubts God's word. I don't think Samuel's going to show up. Then he denies God's word. He goes ahead and he sacrifices instead. And then he just completely disregards it. You know what happens whenever you deny God's word? You're doubting God's character. Do you realize that if Samuel would not have shown up in this moment, one or two things would have happened. One, Samuel would have died because he's a prophet. And if a prophet makes a prophecy and doesn't come through with it, it cost him his life. And then on top of that, if God doesn't keep his word and God doesn't have Samuel show up, then God himself would have lied. And every one of us in here would be wasting our times focusing, trying to be like Christ, because if God would have lied and not shown up, God would have sinned. Well, that's impossible. He's not being logical. He's being emotional. He's not looking at it in the right way. He denies God's word. And then, look at, look at it says in verse 10, or verse 12, he said, he said, the Philistines will come down now to Gilcal. I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. What's he doing there? He, he thinks that he can invoke God's favor by completely living contrary to what God said. Do you realize there are people day in and day out that believe that if they want to be blessed by God, the way to go about it is by living their own way, according to however they want to feel, but I'm going to show up on Sunday morning and God's going to bless me. You, you can't just live God's way for two hours on a Sunday and expect God to bless you the rest of the week by living in sin and doing whatever you want to do. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to God and you're being a terrible testimony to your family and everybody else in the community. What's the Bible say? You're living like a fool. And you can laugh at it, you can mock it, you can disregard it, but you're never going to prove it wrong. Never. He substituted religion for a relationship. If you are here this morning and the only thing you know is religion, I would challenge you, get rid of that junk. Forget that. It's not going to do you any good. You say, well, I've been baptized. That's fine. You can stand before God, tell Him you were baptized. That's not what's going to get you into heaven. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. And then the thing that kind of bothers me the most you read the story, and you see Samuel clearly rebukes him, calls him a moron in front of everybody, and what does Saul do? Does he fall on his knees and beg and cry for forgiveness? No, he just disregards it. He's like, well, preacher, that's good for you, but as for me and my house, we're going to do whatever is right in my own eyes. There's no repentance. There's no feeling bad. There's no remorse at all. He kind of just blows it off and says, yeah, yeah, whatever, but there's nothing there. How many times, and I've been guilty myself, you go into church service, you hear the Word of God preached, you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, and instead of repenting and turning from our sin and doing what we know is right, we say, yeah, that's it's good for you. It's good for you. But that's not how I'm going to live. That's fine. I'm not going to treat you any different. God's still going to love you. But you're going to die a fool. The warning is to me, just as well as anybody else, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention or not, but in the Christian world, the last two or three years, there have been multiple pastors that have fallen because of sexual sin. It can happen to anybody. And I'm not standing up here. I hate the fact that this pulpit is on an elevated stage. Why they did that, I'm not saying you guys, but just in Christianity in general, I'm no different than you guys. I put my pants on the same way. I deal and struggle with the same things you guys struggle with. As a matter of fact, you, you get... In a situation where you feel like your back's against the wall, every one of us begin to act emotionally. 
And we can justify our own actions. And we say, you know, I know the Word of God teaches this and it says this, but in this situation, I I can just do whatever I want. And I'm telling you, it's a reality check. Look at Saul's life. One snowball effect after another. And look what happens. If you still have your Bible open or, or not, open it up and look at this. Verse 13 says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, which God commanded you. Now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. But now the kingdom shall not continue. Do you realize what happened? This rash decision, this emotional, foolish decision cost him the future of a kingdom. Every time we are in a situation and we make a rash, emotional decision that is not according to the word of God, I'm telling you it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. I, I, I understand God's grace and God's love, but there is a balance there. You say, God will heal it all. Yeah, but you're still going to have scars and you're still going to have memories and you're still going to have regrets that you're going to have to live with that is going to cost you something. You can't just live in sin and expect God to bless you and expect to be successful and, and not die a fool. It cost him his future. And Saul... Didn't even regard it. You know, isn't this the way with us too? We get worked up in situations, and and if you pay attention closely, Saul said, I was afraid they're going to come and they're going to kill us. Well, you study the rest of the story, guess what happens? They don't even show up. The Philistines didn't even show up. Everything that he was terrified about, everything that involved his emotional and rash decision, it didn't have to happen. They, it didn't even happen. How many times do we act upon things because we, we think this is what might happen? This reminds me of a story of uh, Pastor Adrian Rogers said. He said one day a lady came up to him after he got done preaching and she was kind of upset. She said, don't tell me worrying doesn't help anything. Most of what I worry about never happens. Some of you are getting that. Most of what I worry about never happens. And as Theo Vaughn would say, exhibit A. So many times we worry about things that never materialize. And we totally neglect the things that we know there's going to be consequences in our own lives. We know is wrong. Yeah, no big deal. Telling you, it's only going to get worse. Let me ask you this morning. Here's the real challenge. Is it foolish to doubt God's word? To mock and scoff at God's word? Is it foolish to question God's character? To deny his word? To choose religion over relationship? Or refuse to repent? The answer is yes. So with God's grace, let's not do those things. Rastishisms, they're going to cost you. And just like Saul acting out of fear, doubt, impatient leads to disaster. Anytime... Instead of trusting God's wisdom and his timing and his character, we're headed for the same destination. Please stand with your head bowed and eyes closed. I went three minutes over. We don't have a piano player. But I'm going to give you a time this morning to hopefully not act like Saul. If God spoke to your heart this morning about a situation in your life that you are potentially or you are in the moment right now acting foolishly, denying God's word, his character... Don't act like Saul. Don't die a fool. Don't live in your foolishness. Repent. Repent of it. Now, I'm not going to promise you it's not going to cost you something. It will, but I remind you of this, that the sins that you are currently living in cost God everything. It cost Him His Son on the cross. And we as believers, every time we choose to sin, man, we we are spitting in the face of that sacrifice. It's a harsh reality. Maybe here this morning and you are not saved. I can tell you, your starting place is at the cross. Maybe here this morning you say, you know, I, I've been choosing relig- or religion over relationship. I do not know Jesus personally. And I've been living in, in it. I've been there. 
For years, I heard preaching, sermon after sermon, message after message about the judgment of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the gospel, all of these things, and I chose to reject it going out into the world knowing that I was facing a judgment. Maybe that's here, you here this morning. You know the truth. You can grow up in church, spend your entire life in church, but if you never put your faith and trust in Christ, you will die and be separated from God for all eternity. What separated Saul and David? The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. What characterizes you this morning? Are you a man or woman after God's own heart? What does that mean? That means you think God's thoughts after him. You strive to live according to him. Or are you like Saul, taking things for granted, not taking things seriously? Nobody's looking around at this time. I want to ask the crowd. No one's looking around, not going to embarrass you. We're Baptists, we're not Methodists, so I'm not going to call you out and drag you up front. I want to ask you a question. Are, do you know you're saved? Is there anybody here this morning who said, you know what, if I was to die right now and stand before God, I, I do not know 100% that I am saved. I'm not going to call you out, I'm not going to embarrass you. If you would please slip up your hand, I'll pray for you. Appreciate that. Anybody else? You want to do business with God? I challenge you, don't take this as another opportunity to lie to yourself and to lie to God again. Do you know for sure? If you're here this morning, you say, you know, I know that I'm saved. I know I've put my faith and trust in Christ. I know that if I was to die right now, that I will be in the presence of the Lord. If that's you here this morning, we raise your hand. That you have 100% surety that you know. And we can know. The Bible teaches that we can know that we know that we know. I'm thankful for that. Maybe you're here this morning and this message hits you the way that hit me as I was studying it. Man, sometimes we make foolish decisions. We can be thankful for the grace of God. I challenge you this morning, if that's you, ask God to forgive you. He loves you. You say this message came across with a strong tone and it didn't sound sincere. I'm sorry. But I can promise you this, regardless of how I sounded, how I communicated it, God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the examples that we can look back on and learn from, Lord. And so many times we can see ourselves in, those, in, those, uh, in their lives, see that we make the same mistakes that they do. Lord, I'm thankful for your forgiveness, thankful for your mercy and your grace, because you love us. Lord, I pray that you help all of us to determine to live our lives based upon your word and the love that you have for us. And then, Lord, I pray that you help us to remember to take that and what we've learned and to share it with others, not to look down upon them for the mistakes they're making, but remember that if it wasn't for the grace of God, we could be in the exact same situation. Lord, we thank you for your son. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that convicts us, that steers us, that guides us in the directions that you want us to go. And Lord, thank you for the times of rebuke. Thank you for the times of correction because you know what ultimately is at the end of that destination. Lord, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.